קרייב. פרופסור קרייב היא מומחית לרפואת ילדים במרכז הלב בבית החולים האוניברסיטאי לילדים באוהיו ובבית הספר לרפואה של אוניברסיטת אוהיו בארצות הברית. בין תפקידיה משמשת פרופסור קרייפ כמתאמת הקלינית לכל מחלות ניוון השרירים בבית החולים לילדים. פרופסור קרייפ מוכרת כמומחית בטיפול בבעיות קרדיאולוגיות הקשורות למחלות ניוון שרירים ובראשן דושן. פרופסור קרייפ סיימה את לימודיה באוניברסיטת איווה עבדה בבתי חולים לילדים בדנבר, בוסטון, ויסקונסין ובסינסינטי, אוהיו. פרופסור קרייפ, בבקשה. Thank you very much. It's an incredible honor to be here in Israel, um, such an incredibly beautiful country, and um, a pleasure to have the opportunity to share um, with you what we do or our thoughts about cardiac care in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy in the United States. Um, I tend to talk very fast in English, so I will work very hard to speak slowly and um, to allow the interpreters to keep up with me. So today, we are going to, um, during the course of my um, talk, hopefully I will answer some um, key questions about cardiac care in uh, young men with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The first question that I will address is, what does cardiomyopathy mean? <laughs> Two, what does heart failure mean? Three, who should care for the heart? Four, when should cardiac care begin? Five, how will the heart be checked? Six, what should I watch for? And seven, what treatment is available? And finally, eight, what um, should carriers have their hearts checked? So to start with, to answer question one, what does cardiomyopathy mean? Here is a diagram of a normal heart. The heart returns to the right side of the heart via the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava where the blue blood then goes through the right atrium, through the right ventricle, and out to the lungs where it picks up oxygen. It comes back from the lungs, enters the left atrium, then the left ventricle, and then gets pumped out to the body. Cardiomyopathy means disease of the heart muscle. So on the um, left-hand side, you have a normal heart, and on the right side, you have a dilated heart, as you do in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As a result, you have muscle cell injury, which results in cell death. The chamber enlarges. The walls of the heart become thin. Scar formation or fibrosis develops, and then function declines. Here is a um, pathology specimen of a patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy showing extensive fibrosis in the heart. On the left-hand side, you see the actual um, heart specimen, and the white tissue, if I had a pointer, in, in the wall of the heart muscle is the scar tissue that forms. And on the right-hand side, oh, I do have a pointer, sorry. So you can see the, whites, the white tissue here is the scar, scar formation in the myocardium. And here is the pathology specimen showing extensive fibrosis in the myocardium. So um, how does this, um, uh, process occur, um, well dystrophin is located inside the cell as has been mentioned by the other speakers this morning um, and is bound to actin at its end terminus and to a large oligomeric complex of membrane glycoproteins at its C terminus. What does heart failure mean? Here, heart failure is a very complex process that involves a very complex mechanism um, that the body, um, when the heart starts to fail, the body tries to compensate, and in the process of trying to compensate, creates more problems. It's obviously very complicated, and heart failure means the heart fails to meet the demands of the body. It does not mean that the heart has failed or stopped working. It occurs when cardiac function is, a, is poor, but can occur with good function and increased demand. 
And it is the body's response, which as previously mentioned, is at first harmful, but then helpful, but then eventually causes harm. People can live long lives with heart failure. Who should care for the heart? A cardiologist is a heart doctor, and pediatric cardiologists specialize in pediatrics as well as cardiology, whereas adult cardiologists specialize in adult medicine and cardiology. Some cardiologists have special interests in heart failure and transplantation or in neuromuscular disorders. Um, you should talk to your son's doctor about finding an expert who is adept at treating heart failure. So somebody who understands um, whether they are a pediatric um, cardiologist or an adult cardiologist, um, the process of the failing heart. When should cardiac care um, start? There have been a number of workshops and a number of documents that have been um, written with regards to trying to get a consensus statement with regards to when cardiac care should begin. Um, the most recent of these documents was drafted by the Center for Disease Control and um, with a group of experts who met on a regular basis to draft the document that was eventually published um, in Lancet Neurology. And what they came up with was that um, in the pre-symptomatic patient, um, the child should have a baseline visit with an echocardiogram and an EKG at the time of diagnosis or by the age of six years. In their early ambulatory years, the max interval should go between, um, should not exceed 24 months between visits until the age of 10, and then visits should occur yearly. As the child ages, uh, yearly visits should continue or occur more frequently depending upon um, symptoms and test results. So to summarize the um, consensus statements, cardiac investigation should begin at diagnosis with repeat investigation at least biannually until the age of 10 or with the onset of cardiac signs and symptoms and then annually after the age of 10 or more frequently based on cardiac signs and symptoms. Obviously prior to any surgery, especially spine surgery, and these are just thought to be minimum recommendations with um, changes um, to be um, implemented by the patient's individual physician. How will the heart be checked? Um, one of the ways we want to check the heart is by looking at the heart's rhythm and um, the heart rate. And this is often done by an electrocardiogram. Um, this child here is seen uh, receiving the EKG where a variety of stickers are placed on um, the child's chest. This allows us to look at the heart rate and rhythm over a very brief um, matter of seconds period of time. And if, if, if concern arises, um, additional monitoring can be undertaken with regards to the heart rate and rhythm through the use of a um, Holter monitor or an event monitor, which allows you to uh, monitor the rhythm for extended periods of time. Um, on the electrocardiogram, we found um, uh, in surveying or reviewing our studies that the EKG was abnormal at a very young age. Actually, in infants who received the diagnosis prenatally, we found EKG abnormalities. Um, and that the type of abnormality changes with time. Um, the fact that the EKG was abnormal, however, was not a predictor of outcome based on our data. That even if your EKG was abnormal at the time of birth, that didn't pretend that um, you would have cardiac um, problems earlier than if your EKG was normal. The heart rate in these uh, young men are often elevated, uh, 10 to 15 beats above normal. The, e the cause for this is, uh, is unknown. Some people think that it may be related to um, the way that the heart regulates, um, uh, the body regulates the heart rhythm. Um, and the most important thing, I think, is that changes um, over time are important. So getting that baseline study and having maybe a copy of your son's electrocardiogram um, to be available in times of illness um, is important. How will the heart be checked? Um, images of the heart will need to be obtained to evaluate structure and function. Um, let's see, did I skip it? So there are two common ways to obtain images of the heart. Um, one of those is by an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart, and the second is through the use of cardiac MRI. At our institution, cardiac MRI has become commonplace, and we don't use the echocardiogram very frequently any longer. 
An echocardiogram, as mentioned, is an ultrasound evaluation of the heart. It allows us to evaluate anatomy as well as function. It allows us to look at how well the heart squeezes as well as how well the heart relaxes. The advantages are that it's readily available and it's quick. However, the disadvantages are that the image quality is often unreliable, especially in this patient population, given, um, given the fact that there's oftentimes deformities of the spine, such as scoliosis, and weight and positional deformities um, may limit our ability to get good images. It's also not very accurate if you're looking for RV function, right, right ventricle, function of the right ventricle. So we are now using cardiac MRI more frequently. Here is an MRI scanner shown, and here is a child's playground piece of equipment. Um, we often tell families that um, they can uh, try to prepare the child for the study by taking them to the playground and, and trying to have them um, maybe even um, see, see the scanner and, and get used to the feeling of laying in, in the machine because it can oftentimes be claustrophobic for the child. Advantages are that there's no radiation exposure. The imaging is done um, using magnets. It allows us detailed cardiac information um, with regards to making accurate measurements, and it provides us really essential information with regards to fibrosis, and we're starting to explore um, uh, looking at uh, using cardiac MRI to evaluate metabolism. The disadvantages are that it involves IV placement, especially if you're going to look for fibrosis. Um, the test can be um, prolonged, it can uh, exceed one hour in duration. Many times it can be claustrophobic um, for the child, um, and, it, and it can be expensive test, and it um, uh, necessitates sedation, especially in younger children. Here um, we see some cardiac findings um, in the Duchenne patient, um, and you can see in some of these um, images here, I don't see the pointer's not right. Maybe. Um, on some of the arrows in the third par paragraph over, you can see that there is um, scar tissue in the, uh, in the myocardium. This is a little bit better imaging that will allow us to um, look for uh, fibrosis in the myocardium in, in the patient with muscular dystrophy. What signs and symptoms should I watch for? Know your son's baseline. Learn to take his pulse, specifically at rest or while busy. Also learn to take his pulse while sleeping. This will allow you to assess for any changes that may occur um, when the child has complaints um, about, about their heart rate. Um, it may be useful to buy a stethoscope. Stethoscopes are readily available um, at, at many drug stores or off the internet, and this will allow you to uh, know what your child's um, baseline uh, symptoms are, or baseline exam is um, uh, if they, in case they should complain and develop a relationship with your care provider before you need them. I think that's really essential, and that's one of the reasons why we recommend baseline testing at the time of diagnosis or early on in the disease. I think establishing a relationship with your cardiologist is important. What, else, what should you watch for? What are signs or symptoms that there's a problem? Uh, rapid weight gain or loss, swelling of the feet or overall puffiness, the heart racing or skipping beats or, um, or fainting, um, as I mentioned, learn to take your son's pulse or maybe by the stethoscope, and chest pain. Chest pain can be very common in these young men, um, and it's usually related to the musculoskeletal system or their muscles, but if it's severe, um, I think it's very important to seek medical attention. What treatments are available? Unfortunately, we currently only have standard heart failure treatments, treatments that are used for all patients who have hearts that don't work as well as they should, and this information is taken from a very extensive um, adult heart failure experience. Unfortunately, the treatment's not based on um, any pediatric data and is not dystrophin specific. The goals of treatment, however, are to improve survival, slow disease progression, and eliminate any symptoms that may be occurring. Treatments that are currently available include heart failure drugs and ACE inhibitors um, or blood pressure type of medicine that has been discussed by um, a number of the presenters already this morning. These, these drugs got, go by some common names of enalapril, lisindapril, or perindapril. Um, this, these, um, there is a, um, information and literature that states that using these drugs before you need them has um, some benefit in this patient population. And currently, um, in our practice, we are starting these drugs early on in the disease process. 
Um, it's very variable as to provider in the United States as to when these drugs are started. I tend to start these drugs, um, especially if there's any symptoms, if I see an elevated heart rate, and definitely if I see any myocardial um, uh, fibrosis or scar tissue forming in the myocardiogram. Angiotensin receptor blockers or Lasartan are also commonly used. Um, and beta blockers such as metoprolol or carvedilol are also commonplace. Um, we tend to start those medications if we notice the um, uh, heart rates being elevated. We don't know that the elevated heart rate that we see in these boys is, is um, something that causes long-term detriment, but um, we um, have tended to um, use these medications to slow the heart rate when we see it. In some of the older um, young men who have more um, uh, symptomatic heart failure, we use diuretics or medicines that take fluid off um, um, the system because fluid accumulates in the body system when the heart isn't working as well as it should. Um, and some of these drugs are called furosemide or thiazide di diuretics. An interesting group of medicines that are currently being explored are the aldosterone receptor agonists, and one of these drugs is spironolactone or aldactone. You may, if you're um, a fan of uh, Google and the internet, have come across the fact that um, a number of invest, uh, uh, one investigator, particularly at Ohio State, has um, has some data that shows that this these drugs, this class of drugs, may be um, useful to um, help prevent uh, fibrosis in the disease. And um, these drugs are now uh, going to trial um, to uh, look to see if that um, could be a benefit. They could be a benefit in in, in Duchenne. Um, also, we tend to use anticoagulation um, therapy, uh, particularly Coumadin or aspirin, in boys who have severe cardiac dysfunction to prevent stroke. So, treatments are, that are available um, are essentially just to reiterate. Um, treatments that are available for um, heart dysfunction, whether you have heart dysfunction from um, uh, a variety of different sources, um, uh, including myocardial infarction, and um, so there's no specific, um, just to reiterate, there's unfortunately no specific treatments at this time that are, uh, that are Duchenne specific. A question that people ask all the time are, does steroids benefit the heart? Um, some literature um, on this is that I think that the answer is probably. Um, steroids, um, in, in the studies that have looked at um, steroid use in Duchenne with regards to when heart failure develops, has shown some benefit from steroid treatment. However, I think historically, if you look at the literature and look at all pediatric literature with regards to the use of steroids, there would be some suggestion that maybe steroids are not overall um, uniformly beneficial. But um, it does look like um, that they may be of some benefit in this specific patient population. So with regards to treatments, um, I think it's very important to always uh, think of it as an individualized risk-benefit analysis. Um, look for uh, benefits with regards to improving abnormal function. And um, the benefits with normal function are unclear. Whether you should start treatment in a, ba in a, in a young man who has yet to manifest symptoms of heart failure, I think, is, is still um, somewhat controversial, though the literature is starting to support the pre-symptomatic treatment in, uh, with ACE inhibitors or beta blockers in this patient population, but that has yet to be definitively established. Um, and then it's definitely the role for research to answer um, when should drugs be started, what agents should be started, what dose, and for how long. And risks. You know, I think risks, all drugs have side effects, and we need to benefit, we need to very carefully um, weigh the benefits um, versus the risks of starting uh, medications in this group of boys. So some um, novel uh, treatments that um, are used in adult heart failure uh, with regards to thinking about their use in, in the pediatric population, um, especially the Duchenne patients, uh, are pacemakers. Uh, cardiac resynchronization, resynchronization therapy is commonplace in adult heart failure. Um, however, we uh, uh, looked at extensive MRI data um, from our patient population in a cohort of around 600 boys and we found that we could not demonstrate um, uh, that the myocardium um, would benefit from this type of therapy. So we do not uh, commonly use 
um, pacemakers uh, for patients with Duchenne as a result. Ventricular assist devices is, is, um, is a technology that I think um, is coming of age and is worth exploring and um, our institution plans on exploring this in the, in the coming year. There um, have been two boys who've had ventricular assist devices placed by Antonio Amadeo in, um, in Rome at um, the Children's Hospital there. Um, he used the Jarvik uh, device as diagrammed here to, um, uh, to act as a pump for a failing heart. Um, these pumps are placed inside um, the chest and um, have a cable that's um, connected to a battery that allows this pump to function. And um, he's been very successful with the two boys that he has um, treated so far, I think with the longest one um, still doing well 18 months after device has been placed. Um, this is a therapy that's used very, in, very commonly for adult heart failure. Um, and I think it has a tremendous amount of potential benefit for the Duchenne population. It may be useful as a bridge for transplantation or for um, destination therapy for, um, and destination therapy just means that it will be the therapy that um, you live your life with. Um, cardiac transplantation, um, very few DMD boys um, have been transplanted. We have one boy who was transplanted at our institution in Ohio who is doing well five years out. Um, but it was, it's very um, complicated and, and tough to get um, these young men transplanted, at least in the United States, because of limited donor availability. Um, you're also trading one disease for another. Um, chronic immunosuppression and um, life after a cardiac transplant is not easy. And um, so um, it is not a uh, easy solution to a complex problem. And then um, the last question is, should carriers have their hearts, hearts checked? Often cardiac disease is the only manifestation of carrier status. Cardiomyopathy risk increases with age. Um, there was a study done um, and approximately, looking at approximately 350 uh, Duchenne or Becker uh, muscular dystrophy carriers. Um, at age 16, all of them were normal, but this was by echocardiogram because the study is somewhat dated. Um, they found an in, a 6% um, incidence between the age of 16 and 30, a 9% incidence between ages 31 and 50, and a greater than, um, in greater than 50 years of age, a 16% risk. But once again, this is um, by traditional means of looking with an echocardiogram. I think that the adult heart failure people at at least the institution I'm currently working at would, would recommend that these carriers be followed um, with cardiac MRI because we were, are looking for the development of fibrosis. So the current recommendations in the literature, and I think that these are pretty conservative, are that uh, carrier mothers should have a baseline evaluation as a young adult with a frequency of re-evaluation being very unclear every three to five years, I think, is what we recommend to our families. Um, and for mothers to be aware of your symptoms, and I think um, to take care of yourself. Obviously, um, you're very busy and, and you have a lot of, um, of stress and multitasking to do as a mother. Um, but you need to take the time out to, to take care of your own health. And to uh, try to minimize um, other cardiovascular risks such as smoking, um, hypertension, or cholesterol as well. Um, and this is a um, slide demonstrating that actually um, when, when looking with MRI that um, uh, it, it has been noted to manifest as uh, myocardial fibrosis in the, in, the, in the Duchenne carrier mother. So in conclusion, cardiac evaluation should begin at diagnosis. Ongoing cardiac follow-up is important and best way to ensure long-term health. When there is evidence of abnormal function, treatment is recommended. And early treatment prior to the onset of defunction, dysfunction is unproven and um, also controversial. And it's important to consider the risks and benefits. And um, I think it's most important to use common sense at all times and to maintain an open dialogue with all the care providers because they are working for you and that you and your family are the most important members of the healthcare team and make sure your wishes and, and your thoughts and are shared with your care provider. So thank you. Mm -hmm.